Welcome to the course on Gender Analysis in Economic Policy Research. In this module, you will receive an overview of the major issues and topics that will be covered in this course from a microeconomic perspective. We will begin with reviewing the learning objectives. We follow this with some important definitions and distinctions used in the course, especially the distinction between gender and sex. We then ask why we think gender is important. After this, we will look at three areas in which gender analysts in economics have contributed to the discipline of economics. Economics of the household, unpaid work and care work, and finally, economics of the labour market. In the last area, we will take a look at the latest contributions relating to gender in economics. At the end of this course, you should be able to distinguish between gender and sex and between instrumental and intrinsic motives for wanting gender equality. You should be able to identify gaps and flaws in some standard economic models and theory that ignore gender relations and be able to distinguish between policies that are gender blind and those that are gender neutral. We will now define the concepts of gender and gender equality and the motivations for promoting gender equality. First, the difference between gender and sex. Sex refers to the biological attributes that define being male or female. Gender, on the other hand, refers to how society interprets these sex differences. It refers to socially given roles, activities, needs, responsibilities and characteristics connected to being male or masculine or female or feminine in a society at a given time. To drive home the difference between sex and gender, look at the difference between the two pairs of symbols on the right side of the slide. On the top right hand side, the signs that we often see on ladies and gents restrooms. These symbolize the biological difference between male and female. The symbols for male and female given on the lower right are shown in the colors that society associates with femininity, pink, and masculinity, blue. Gender thus reflects social codes that tell people how they are supposed to think of themselves and how they are supposed to interact with each other. For example, those who identify as men may also want to behave as men are socially expected to behave. Those who identify as women may want to behave as women are socially expected to behave. For each of the following, select whether the issue is a gender issue or a sex issue. In each case, consider the reason for your selection. Women can get pregnant. Is this a gender issue or a sex issue? Why? In general, women earn less than men. Is this a gender issue or a sex issue? Why? Men usually have short hair. Women usually have long hair. Is this a gender issue or a sex issue? Why? Women are more likely to take career breaks than men. Is this a gender issue or a sex issue? And why? Women entrepreneurs have limited opportunities to interact with competitors, officials and men. Is this a gender issue or a sex issue? Why? Women usually do most of the unpaid work in the household. Is this a gender issue or a sex issue? Why? Most women cannot grow beards. Is this a gender issue? Or a sex issue? Why? In bargaining, women are often less assertive than men. Is this a gender issue or a sex issue? Why? Women usually have bigger hips than men. Is this a gender issue or a sex issue? Why? Women find it harder to get a loan than men. Is this a gender issue or a sex issue? Why? Women find it harder to exit an unsatisfactory relationship than men. Is this a gender issue or a sex issue? Why? Women can lactate, men cannot. Is this a gender issue or a sex issue? Why? Women own less land than men. 
Is this a gender issue or a sex issue? Why? Women receive less agricultural extension services than men. Is this a gender issue or a sex issue? Why? Here are the answers to the questions on the previous slides. Did you get them right? Do you now have a sense of how social norms determine whether an issue is a gender issue or whether it is purely a biological difference between men and women? Does gender inequality stem from differences in sex or from gender norms? Gender is a social construct in the sense that society defines and differentiates the roles, rights, responsibilities and obligations of women and men. Biological differences between females and males are interpreted by society to create a set of social expectations that define the behaviours that are appropriate for women and men and determine women's and men's differential access to rights, resources and power in society. These in turn influence the often unequal outcomes in the treatment, economic behaviour and activities of men and women. The unequal sizes of the symbols for men and women are shown in pink and blue to show that gender inequality arises from socially constructed gender roles. Why do we care about gender equality? Gender equality is a human right that is enshrined in CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of All Types of Discrimination Against Women. It was adopted by the UN in 1979 and ratified by 187 countries. That gender equality is a human right is recognised by dedicating one of the Sustainable Development Goals to the achievement of gender equality. It is also included in all the other SDGs as it affects all dimensions of development. This provides us with an intrinsic or equity motive to desire gender equality. But apart from that, removing barriers to education, economic opportunities and productive inputs can generate broad productivity gains. Improving women's absolute and relative status improves development outcomes, especially of the next generation. Increasing women's individual and collective agency leads to better outcomes, institutions and policy choices. A common motivation for desiring gender equality relies on its economic gains, which is an instrumental or efficiency motive. From an advocacy point of view, the instrumental approach has been more successful than the intrinsic approach, as Naila Kebir's reflection indicates. Advocacy on behalf of women, which builds on claimed synergies between feminist goals and official development priorities, has made greater inroads into the mainstream development agenda than advocacy, which argues for these goals on intrinsic grounds. While the instrumental motive underlies the notion that gender equality is smart economics, it is important to note that gender equality does not always lead to better overall economic outcomes. For example, there may be trade-offs between gender equality and economic growth. For example, Segrino, 2000, shows that in the short run, higher female wages can be contractionary, a point that is further elucidated in the module on trade. Therefore, while the instrumental motive has proven to be successful from an advocacy point of view, the intrinsic motive provides a more consistent basis for arguing for gender equality and is, indeed, a sufficient motive. Why is it important to include a gender perspective in economics? The underlying reality of what economists study is gendered. Incorporating this reality in our models is good economics. Ignoring it is bad economics. Feminist economics has played a crucial role in exploring gender relations within the different social and economic situations for women.
Feminist economists dispute the gender-biased assumptions that underpin the way our economies work. Feminist economics recognises the interdependent relationship between the productive and reproductive spheres, between paid and unpaid work, and between earning a living and caring for the family. Quoting this October 2015 article from The Economist on the thinking behind feminist economics, Julie Nelson, a feminist economist, writes in the Journal of Economic Perspectives that many readers may have discovered that they are already doing feminist economics in some ways, although they have preferred to think of themselves as just doing good economics. Indeed, feminist economists wish they lived in a world where the label need not exist. Gender relations permeate economic institutions and affect outcomes. Economic relationships transactions and exchange have gender relations inscribed within them. Gender affects the household division of labour, the work burden of women, women's labour force participation, wage gaps between women and men, fertility rates, economic growth and distribution, economic development and the quality of life and human well-being. The next slide illustrates how gender bias in households, institutions and markets affects economic outcomes and leads to gender gaps. For example, this diagram from the World Development Report 2012 shows how women's economic opportunities may be limited because of constraints encountered within households themselves due to gender bias in the allocation of time and resources, they are encountered in informal institutions such as social norms about gender roles relating to care and market work. They are encountered in markets which provide differential access to factors of production and they are encountered in formal institutions where biased laws and regulations and limited infrastructure compound the limited access that women already face in terms of economic opportunities. Thus, there is a gender gap in economic opportunities for men and women because of gender bias within the household, within institutions and within markets. We discuss these specific aspects in relation to the labour market further on in this module and in the module on labour markets. But much of economic theory and many traditional models do not reflect the underlying gendered reality. This is evident in standard models that are based on a gender neutral individual. The unitary model of the household assumes homogeneity of individuals who have identical preferences. This leads to empirical models that attempt to capture gender effects by the incorporation of a gender dummy ignoring important gender differences in the rest of the model. The focus is on the public sphere of production and ignores the private sphere of household production, reproduction and care. An example is given in the Economist article that we referred to previously. Feminist economics also criticises the methods used within the standard models taught to undergraduates for overlooking fundamental drivers of gender inequality. Take a simple economic model which might explain a woman's decision to take on the bulk of childcare responsibilities based on her preferences for consumption and leisure. Feminist economists might point out that if her preferences have been formed by society with the strong ideas about what women should do, then presenting her choice as a free one could be misleading. By ignoring potential discrimination against women, such a model could allow sexism to go unchallenged, they would argue. When economists acknowledge gender in analysis, they do so by using simple binary indicator functions, so-called dummy variables, to alter, intercept and or slope coefficients in regression. 
Feminist economists have argued that these are poor analytical substitutes for more complete models of the role gender plays in market and non-market transactions. They have argued for the latter, which are invisible to be made visible, so that they may be measured and accounted for, and the ensuing gender bias be addressed. We next focus on three main areas of contribution to gender analysis and economics. They are household economics, unpaid work and care work, labour markets, discrimination and the differences between men and women. While these are not the only contributions of feminist or gender economics, we focus on the contributions of gender economists in these three areas over the rest of the module. This section on household economics foreshadows the module on economics of the household. Many topics touched upon here are examined in greater detail in that module, as well as in the modules on agriculture, migration and entrepreneurship. The surge of intra-household research in the 1980s and 1990s and thereafter was due to four main reasons. The development of new models of household decision-making, an increased awareness that paying attention to intra-household allocation matters in the design and implementation of development policy, the growing availability of data from developing and developed countries with which to test alternative household models, and the use of qualitative methods arising from increased collaboration with anthropologists and other social scientists to understand non-economic dimensions of human behaviour. Feminist economists like McElroy and Horney, 1981, and Mansur and Brown, 1980, introduced cooperative bargaining models of the household. At the same time, Agricultural household models, like that of Strauss, Singer and Squire, 1986, modelled households as both the location of production and consumption, and questioned the separability of the two functions. Research in many disciplines in agriculture, especially in West Africa, challenged the notions of households as a single unit of either production or consumption. Another important contribution by feminist economists were analyses on valuing unpaid work and time use. Module 3 on household economic models will present the theory and results of this research in more detail. Here we share some key insights from three categories of non-unitary household models. A unitary household assumes that households act like one individual. Everyone either has the same preferences or a single individual acts like a dictator and imposes his or her preferences. The main insight from cooperative bargaining models is that the options available to people outside the household, e.g. independently controlled income or threat point, will affect the distribution of resources within the household. A related policy implication is that changing the outside options of individuals within households would affect resource distribution within the household. The main insight from collective models is that allocations within the household depend on a sharing rule, an agreed upon way that household members allocate expenditure, and this sharing rule can be derived from the data. The main insight from non-cooperative bargaining models is that households do not necessarily reach Pareto optimal outcomes, that is, outcomes that cannot be improved further without making trade-offs between outcomes of individuals, an insight that has strong empirical support from research in the last few decades. These models are based on more realistic assumptions such as the possibility of private information and limited communication between spouses. More recent theoretical work has modelled households in which commitment between members is not assumed and is often limited. The efficiency is not always attained.
However, each of these three types of models has given us more insight into intra-household dynamics and the bargaining power of women. Unitary or non-unitary? The difference can matter for policy. For example, if household members do in fact have different preferences, resources and responsibilities, then designing policies while relying on a model of the household that assumes that individuals share the same preferences and pool their resources, the unitary model, may lead to policy failures. Examples of these policy failures are examined in the module on household economics. Public transfers are often targeted at households, but received by individuals. The effect of public transfers may differ depending on the identity of the income recipient. Households may reallocate resources away from the transfer recipient to compensate for the transfer receipt. Policy initiatives and information addressed to one person in the household may not be shared with other household members. And assuming that households act as one disables many policy levers that could be brought to bear on development problems. For example, if, as we show later, women and men have different spending patterns on children's health and education, women spend more, then a transfer that is intended to benefit children could be given to women rather than men. Here are three examples of evidence for different preferences within households. In a 1990 paper, Duncan Thomas found, in a national sample of Brazil, that preferences of wives and husbands differ. Wives spend more on household public goods that improve outcomes of health, nutrition and education. Unearned income in wives' hands increased household demand for nutrition four times compared to the same income in husband's hands, and child survival increased by 20 times. Esther Duflo, in a 2003 study of grandmothers and granddaughters, found that the effect of unearned income, pension, to black grandmothers in South Africa in the early 1990s, after the end of apartheid, improved health status measured by WHZ and HAZ scores of granddaughters, but not grandsons. The same pension, when in the hands of grandfathers, did not have the same effect. And the work of John Hodinot and Lawrence Haddad, 1995, showed that income in the hands of women increases budget share of food and decreases share of alcohol and cigarettes. We now look at a well-known study that tests for empirical evidence of the unitary model, cooperative behaviour and Pareto optimality in agricultural production. In a unitary model of the household, agricultural inputs would be allocated across plots based on marginal output rather than on identity of the household member controlling the plot. Udry, 1996, finds that fertiliser and labour are not allocated efficiently across men's and women's plots in Burkina Faso. Reallocating from men's to women's would increase total output. This means that by reallocating resources, equity gains can be achieved without sacrificing efficiency. It also indicates the absence of the unitary model in this scenario. This figure from the 2012 World Development Report shows that in agriculture, large and significant gender disparities in access to inputs, including land and credit, and in asset ownership are at the root of the gender productivity gap. Citing from the report, indeed, yield differences for female and male farmers disappear altogether when access to productive inputs is taken into account. Differences in access to inputs may be further compounded by differences in the availability of market time, which can make the same investment less productive for women than for men. Jointly, these constraints mean that women entrepreneurs and farmers are often restricted to businesses and activities that are less profitable 
and less likely to expand. Here, we present just one example from a growing literature investigating the intra-household decision-making process and the non-cooperative strategies put in place by individuals to secure individual access to private resources given the constraints imposed by norms governing gender roles in farming, resource provision and time use. A study by McPeak and Doss examined intra-household behaviour among pastoralists in northern Kenya in a region where traditionally men decide where to locate each season and women control the use of milk. It showed that whether and how much milk to sell in the market is contested between husbands and wives. The presence of market opportunities leads husbands to locate the household farther from the town to limit milk sales. It appears that in this case, control over wives' resources and mobility is more important than maximising household income. In another study by Ashraf in 2009, she shows that men are willing to sacrifice money that could not be regained in order to make sure that the wife does not know about it. This example from a gender perspective shows how intra-household dynamics can impact a spouse's ability to meet the need for capital. In a 2008 study, Diane Fletchner models intra-household dynamics and women's access to credit. When husbands oppose their wives' participation in income-generating activities, there are several ways in which they can limit wives' access to credit. These include limiting the working capital available to them by restricting their access to family funds, by making it difficult for them to go to the financial institutions or participate in committee meetings, by not helping them pay membership shares, or by not granting them access to property that can be used as collateral. Whether or not, and to what extent, husbands are able to enforce their preferences depends on the strength of their relative bargaining power. An important contribution of gender economists was to make the entire area of unpaid work, and care work, which is a large part of it, visible. We touch on this subject very briefly here, but devote Module 6 to understanding this area better. The point that unpaid work creates value underpinning much of the visible economy, but is itself invisible in economics, is an important one. The work that has been done to make unpaid work visible is a major contribution of gender economics. This slide briefly presents the significance of unpaid work and care work. These topics are examined further, both in the macroeconomic overview to this course, as well as in the module on unpaid work and care work. Unpaid work creates value, but is invisible and restricts women's choices. Unpaid work creates value because children grow up to become workers as well as taxpayers, as Nancy Fulbright has pointed out in a 2008 article. Put another way, household members who perform the unpaid work of daily domestic chores and caring activities assume important costs of producing the labour force and social fabric. The invisibility to policymakers of the non-market sector and of its important linkages with the market sector, particularly labour markets, has negative consequences. It reinforces the notion that workers and their families can find their own solutions to deal with family and care responsibilities and there is no need for government support or public sector provisioning. The gender division of labour and time devoted to unpaid work in the household is depicted clearly in the figure. The burden of unpaid work restricts women's choices, especially that between paid and non-market work. It shows how such constrained choice can lead to low female labour force participation and also to disproportionate representation of women in informal work or in on-farm employment.
This section foreshadows the module Gender and the Labour Market, focusing on gender earnings gaps, discrimination and new economics of gender. It shows that men and women have very different experiences of the labour market. It focuses on several important advances that were made in the study of labour markets as women began to enter it in larger numbers. And it highlights that it is impossible to study the labour market experience of a sexless individual because labour markets are so gendered. Why do women earn less than men on average or across the distribution? Across countries and across occupational categories, women earn less than men, from only 10% less among farmers in Malawi to 88% less among entrepreneurs in Bangladesh. Focusing just on wage gaps, the map shows that with the exception of very few countries, marked by the yellow areas, women earn lower wages than men the world over. In the regions marked in red, women earn as much as 30 to 50% less than men. In Bolivia, the gender wage gap is 22%. These wage gaps are raw gaps. In other words, they do not control for the factors that may make men or women more productive than the other. Some argue that the reason for the wage gap is because women have smaller quantities of productivity enhancing characteristics like years of education. But in many countries, education cannot explain these differences and counterintuitively increases the gap. For example, in Bolivia, controlling for education increases the gap by 18%. This suggests that men and women are rewarded differently for the same characteristics, which suggests discrimination. Others argue that the gender wage gaps are due to the occupations and industries in which men and women are engaged. And indeed, when these are controlled for, the gender wage gap decreases by 39% in Bolivia. But is this difference the result of occupational choice or occupational segregation? Feminist economists like Barbara Bergman, in a seminal article in 1974, argued that the choice is a constrained choice. Women are tracked into lower paying occupations. Indeed, and as we have seen, when women spend more time in domestic work, they are likely to seek work in flexible occupations and industries which pay less. Why do women earn less than men on average? A very common approach to answering this question accounts for the productivity-enhancing differences between men and women, such as human capital. Some studies also control for other composition effects, such as occupational differences, unionisation and working conditions. Nevertheless, after all these are accounted for, there still remains a sizeable gap. In one estimate, as large as 9-17% to 17 in the United States. Moreover, some would argue, as we pointed out before, that we should not account for gender differences in occupations because occupational segregation, not choice, is what leads to women being in the lower paying jobs. The part of the gender wage gap that cannot be explained by productive characteristics that is, the unexplained portion, is considered to be a measure of discrimination, a method credited to Blinder 1973 and Oaxaca 1973. As the caption to this picture implies, discrimination occurs when men and women who are identical in every other aspect are given different treatment simply because of their gender. In more recent times, Economists have used experimental methods to test for discrimination. Zubin Mehta is supposed to have infamously said these words, I just don't think women should be in an orchestra. Golden and Rouse, in a 2000 study, used blind auditions to examine if hiring in orchestras was biased. They found that blind auditions increased the likelihood that a woman would be hired 
by between 25 and 46 percent. In fact, with blind auditions, women became slightly more likely to be hired than men. Also important are the different effects being married and having children have on men and women. Women face a motherhood penalty for bearing children, while men gain a marital wage premium. Are women and men different? Psychological and socio-psychological factors are now more commonly discussed as possible explanations for gender differences in labour market outcomes. In this section, we draw on a seminal work by Marion Bertrand that explores the research on gender differences in preferences and personality traits and the relationship between social and gender identity norms and women's labour market choices and outcomes, as well as on the role of child-rearing practices in explaining gender identity norms. In this section, we briefly review the contributions of the new economics of gender. Several of these topics are elaborated on in the module on the labour market. Here we just focus on a few areas, non-experimental survey-based, psychological attributes and the gender wage gap, experimental, four major research areas, attitudes to risk, attitudes to competition, social preference, caring about others, attitudes to negotiation, nature or nurture, gender identity. Survey-based research on personality traits focuses on traits like the big five, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Each big five trait condenses several distinct and more narrowly defined traits. Other traits or non-cognitive skills or socio-emotional skills, as these are sometimes known, included grit, hostile attribution bias, decision-making, time preference, and locus of control, which refers to the extent people believe they have control over events. Measures of the first nine traits in this list are available in a dataset collected by the World Bank, the Skills Toward Employment and Productivity Program. These traits, or non-cognitive skills, are measured by asking respondents to assess themselves in response to the listed questions. The questions on this slide are those used by the World Bank's STEP survey to measure the dimensions of the Big Five and other personality traits. Survey-based research uses such measures along with and in the same manner as other measures of human capital, such as education and experience to examine if differences in such skills or attributes explain the gender earnings gap. What does the survey-based and experimental research on personality traits and preferences tell us about gender differences within these? How do they affect earnings gaps? Studies reviewed in Bertrand 2011 show that women are less likely than men to negotiate and compete and are likely to be more risk averse. However, there are some caveats to keep in mind. Even if there are such gaps, they can change and skills can be taught. The nature versus nurture research agenda is still ongoing. Also, even when there are gaps, they may not always favour men. Women may have more people skills. Bertrand's 2011 review cites field research with the Carby patrilineal and CAR-C matrilineal in India by Ganesi, Leonard and List that suggests that gender differences in spatial abilities, cognitive, are also environmentally determined. Studies that analyse cross-country variation in the gender gap in math scores find that when controlling for sexism, 
using measures such as the World Economic Forum's Gender Gap Index, the male favouring gender gap in maths becomes smaller and the female favouring gap in reading becomes larger, providing support for the theory that an environment of gender inequality can foster gender disparities in skills. Evidence from single-sex versus mixed schools in England shows that girls in mixed schools were more risk-averse and less willing to compete than their single-sex school counterparts. Booth and Nolan, 2009. This leads us back to the basic premise that gender is a social construct distinct from the biological difference between sexes. Whether gender differences in preferences and personality traits have their roots in nature or nurture matters for policy. If nurture, then there is a role for well thought out educational reforms to address gender gaps in attitudes and non-cognitive skills like risk aversion. On the other hand, if nature were at the root of gender differences in the willingness to operate in a competitive environment, Bertrand, 2011, points out that affirmative action policies may be the best way to ensure that higher ability women are included and lower ability men excluded in competitive settings. Are women more altruistic than men? The evidence suggests that it may be so. Bertrand, 2011, reviews the field evidence that is consistent with a higher level of altruism and stronger preferences for redistribution among women. Drawing from recent evidence in the context of political preferences of women in developed countries. Bertrand concludes that the evidence suggests there might be true psychological differences between men and women in the strength of their social preferences, which may lead women to settle for lower wages. The literature also suggests that individuals who exhibit more greed and less altruism earn more. This conclusion is important in helping us understand gender wage inequality and also leads us to question models of rational economic human beings who are self-interested rather than altruistic. Akerlof and Cranton, 2010, define the concept of identity as a sense of belonging to a social category, combined with a view about how people who belong to that category behave. Departures from these norms generate costs, so people seek to avoid them. Identity directly enters the utility function, so that economic actions can in part be explained by a desire to conform with one's sense of self, and can be used to explain why women who are employed in the labour market still do a disproportionate share of non-market work. Research by Fortime, 2005, uses the World Values Survey that elicits information on egalitarian or otherwise social attitudes and social representation of women as homemakers and men as breadwinners, and attitudes such as mother's guilt, and finds that these attitudes are closely associated with the female labour force participation decision. Studies that examine the intergenerational transmission of gender role attitudes Fare and Vela, 2013 Fernandez, Folgi and Olivetti, 2004 find that female labour force participation is associated with having parents, mothers or mothers-in-law, in the former case, with less traditional views of the role of women. As with the risk attitudes and attitudes towards competition, girls who attend single-sex schools are less likely to hold stereotypical views of gender roles even after they no longer attend these schools. To summarise, this module shows that incorporating a gender perspective into microeconomics changes the way households and labour markets are analysed. 
it is important to identify that gender is a social construct that leads to unequal gender outcomes and to see that gender relations permeate economic institutions and affect outcomes. Economics that takes this gendered reality into account is good economics or good science. Research in economics of the household shows that household members' preferences are not identical. Threat points or outside options influence intra-household bargaining and distribution of outcomes, and households do not necessarily reach Pareto-efficient outcomes. All of the above have had important implications for the design of policy. It is important to acknowledge that unpaid work creates value, but is invisible and restricts women's choices. We then observed the economics of the labour market and the gender gaps in earning and hiring. Productive characteristics like education and experience play a small part in these gaps while occupational choice or segregation play a large part. Most importantly, discrimination plays a significant part in the existence of gender gaps. Finally, we explored new perspectives on gender which showed that personality traits and preferences do affect earnings, identity explains gender inequality in time allocation, Cultural norms explain labour force participation and household decision making. And nurture has a role to play in the development of preferences and identity. The importance of these relative to structural inequalities generated by markets is yet to be established.